Hello everyone, thank you for coming to my lecture. My name is Hillary Green. <coughs> I mean, you already all know my name, otherwise you wouldn't be here, but the YouTube videos tend to get like 30 to 40 votes and I don't want them not to know. So I'm doing my talk, obviously, on perpetual motion. Before we begin, I just wanted to get a few things out of the way. First of all, this is te a very technical topic. I try to make it as accessible as possible to people who aren't physics majors, but if there's anything you do not understand, please point that out. I will try to clarify. Second, this is an open conversation, so if you have any questions, do not wait until the end. Feel free to ask them immediately. Third and finally, I tend to speak very fast and slur most of my words. I will try to avoid this, but if you can understand me, again, please point that out. Or you can just throw something at me, but not too hard. I should be able to dodge it. Anyway, perpetual motion is any machine that produces more energy than it requires to run. Such a machine would obviously provide free and infinite energy for everyone. Unfortunately, we have yet to actually build one. People throughout the centuries have tried and failed. When you ask them why, they tend to say that free energy suppressors are stopping them, trying to keep the big businesses in power. If you ask anybody else, the reason why it doesn't work is called science, or particularly <laughs> thermodynamics. Specifically, energy cannot be created or destroyed, the entropy of a closed system cannot decrease, and a system cannot reach absolute zero temperature. Now quickly, show of hands, does everybody understand the second part? Okay, awesome. So, now I guess it's just time to show some such some examples of the systems. The earliest one is called the um, Braxa Two Wheel, the magic wheel that he created in around 1150. There were probably attempts before this, but this is the first one we know about. This wheel had a set of mercury, as you can obviously see, and as the wheel turned this way, the mercury would fly out the ends and create a greater torque. That means that it would create a greater rotational force on the wheel. And this way, it would always have one end heavier than the other end, and it will always keep rotating. Now, obviously, this doesn't work. Otherwise, we would have had free energy for the past 1,000 years. The reason why is that as these um, go outward, what happens is it changes the angular momentum, how hard it is to move, and with the angular inertia, how hard it is to move. And what this does is it, because angular momentum must be conserved, basically how hard it is to rotate times how fast it's rotating must always be constant. So the wheel will slow down, which means that work is being done on it, which means it is losing energy. And as it comes up here and flies inward, the exact opposite happens. The rotational inertia decreases, the wheel speeds up, and work is done on the wheel. And if you do an analysis of the wheel itself, this all balances out. And therefore, the wheel does not create or lose any energy from the um, overbalancing. So, of course, nobody ever tried this again. In 2030, Villefort de, de Hanicourt attempted the exact same thing, except this time he used hammers. Of course, it had the same problem. You know, energy was lost throwing them out, energy was gained pulling them in, and it all balanced out. So nothing happened. Is anyone seeing a pattern here? <laughs> This is actually a form of perpetual motion called overbalanced wheel. Specifically that one end of the wheel is always heavier than the other. And as I just explained, it simply doesn't work. This has not stopped many, many people from trying it. In fact, for most of the medieval ages, maybe nine-tenths of all perpetual motion machines were overbalanced wheels. We'll be seeing them a lot in the future. And after they realized that overbalanced wheels didn't work, people started getting creative and made fancy overbalanced wheels. The first, this one is James Ferguson's attempt in the 18th century. What would happen is, as these um, balls would move down, it would pull the pistons up, and then would create an underbalancing at both ends. What you do not understand is that as it rotated this way, these pistons would fall down and pull these balls up, which exactly counterbalanced what he attempted to do. Therefore, it didn't work. George Lipton, about 100 years later, tried this. What would happen was, they, these wheels would lock at the top, and then as it's turned or they fall over and therefore create more torque. Which is very fancy, but exactly what people tried, you know, for the past 600 years. So it didn't work either. These pretty much compromised all of the um, professional motion machines for about 500 years. Until in 1648, somebody, specifically one bishop, had an idea. Magnets! His attempt was to simply put a magnet down here, it would roll up due to a magnetic effect over there, and when it reached the top, gravity would pull it back down. So the problem with this, in fact, is that the problem with this, in fact, is that 
magnetic force is called an inverse square. In other words, as you have the distance, the, the force on an object will quadruple, which meant that it had to be strong enough to pull the object against gravity over here, and by the time it got to over here, it was stronger than gravity and the object simply wouldn't fall. There were multiple attempts to avoid this in the future by making more and more complex things, such as the follows, but they all had pretty much the same problem. This is called the simple, simple magnetic over unity toy, which appeared in the 1800s, and like the rest of them, did not work. Exact same problems as the previous one. And then people realized that obviously simply having ramps would not work, so they tried another attempt. Overbalanced wheels! <laughs> this was basically the overbalanced wheel, except that instead of simply having weights, it used magnets. The problem with this is that as you can see, as the um, object got further away from the um, magnets over here, it would, the magnets would push up, would repel them, push away. The problem was that as the magnets were up there, they would also push away, and all effects would essentially cancel each other out. Once again, simply not working. Oh, hey, I've got a remote. Fancy that. These um, was a more complex version of that, where we try to combine the basic types of an overbalanced tool of torquing with magnetism repelling. Like the other things, it did not work. The exact same reason the simple overbalanced wheels and the magnetic overbalanced wheels didn't work. This was the only attempt in that area that actually tried something different. What would happen was this ball would be attracted to this magnet and it would move and it would move up, causing the wheel to rotate back. I was simply doing that forever. The problem in this case was that the wheel would go about to here and then stop. Gravity and magnetism would exactly cancel each other out there and nothing would happen. People did try to get more clever later. This is called the Romag, and appeared around 1998. So it's much more recent than the previous attempts, which were all around the Middle Ages in the Renaissance. This worked as an actual circuit. There were magnets on the inside and solenoids on the outside. As the magnets would spin around, it would create electricity in the solenoids, which would then be fed into a battery which would then be fed into a motor, which would then spin around the magnets faster. What these people missed was that as the magnets spun around the um, solenoids, the solenoids would get charged, and the charge of the solenoids would create a backwards magnetic field that would slow down the magnets. Once again, canceling everything out and making nothing work. Incidentally, when they were describing this, they said it's that most other generators stole energy from the Earth's ionosphere, which is filled with pulsating neutrons. This is something you will see throughout the future and throughout the past in professional motions. People who build them mostly do not actually understand science. And it should be noted that even people who do understand science also get things regularly wrong. This was actually created by the famous biologist, Roger, famous physicist, Boyle, famous for Boyle's law and such about gas things. His idea was that first, taking an old invention, this part would be heavier than this part, right? So this part would push down, this part would go up and fill in. This didn't work, obviously, because, as we know from fluid dynamics, this will exert the exact same pressure as this will. So Boyle tried to modify it. He said that by capillary action, this would go up and pour down, which also didn't work. According to capillary action, this would go up and just stay there. All the water would just collect over here, and nothing would change. Boyle wasn't the only person to have actually had a problem with this. Bernoulli, Bernoulli, not to be confused with Daniel Bernoulli, this was John Bernoulli, his father, also attempted a fluid professional motion machine, which tended to trip up a lot of scientists. This was fairly simple. In the inner tube, there would be a very light, there'd be a very light liquid, and in the outer tube, there'd be a very heavy 